to the girls, to the women, to the little girl inside the woman, that you are more than enough, that you are powerful beyond measure. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. I am your host, Dr. Weta L. Brown. I inspire and promote movement. I explain how running adds to life from a mental wholeness aspect, how obstacles can be overcome in life to make it to your finish line. Welcome to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast, episode 33. Today, I have a special friend from Philadelphia, Audra and also on. She is the founder and CEO of Beauty Fit Strong. Beauty Fit Strong was established in 2015 as a fitness business and lifestyle brand that encourages girls and women to step outside of their comfort zone and live beyond their limits. The brand is composed of Beauty Fit Strong Fitness Studio. It is a physical fitness and wellness education business. In addition to the fitness studio, there is a camp for girls. The camp for girls is a summer program that is designed to empower girls through education, fitness, and fun activities. Audra began her fitness career as a bodybuilding competitor in 2014. As a result, she decided to start her own business. Audra is a leader and visionary with roles including camp founder and director, fitness studio owner, bodybuilding coach, corporate wellness coach, workshop facilitator, and health advocate. She currently serves as a member of the Mid-Atlantic Region's Advisory Council for the National Library of Health Medicine. Her other volunteer efforts include partnership with schools and community organizations throughout the Philadelphia community and surrounding areas. Audra is passionate about health and fitness. Again, Audra is a dear friend of mine from my time in Philadelphia. Her husband, Uche, was the leader of my first running club, the club that helped make me a distant runner. She has also served as my virtual trainer. Welcome, Audra, to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Well, welcome again to Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Hello. (laughs) Thank you for having me. So you originally were a social worker. So how did you go from being a social worker to being the uh, CEO of Beauty Fit Strong? Yes, I started my career in social work, working with children specifically, um, and did that for a really long time. Uh, but I, I was trauma focused, you know, in my work. Uh, that was my specialty. And so it was very draining for me. Uh, it took a lot out of me, very taxing. And after a while, I really just began to get burned out. And so it pushed me into an unhealthy you know, a frame of mind, an unhealthy mindset. I ate, I, you know, I had low energy, you know, just really didn't feel about, feel good about who I was and where I was, you know, at that particular part of my life. And I, after that, after um, doing that for a long time and being in that place, I wanted to do something different. And I began bodybuilding. I met someone from BGR who had competed And I asked her, you know, like, how can I do that? You know, how can I? um, BGI is Black Girls Run for people who. Yes, Black Girls Run here in Philadelphia. Yep. So I met a woman and um, she had competed and I was like, okay, so I I think that's something I can do. And because I had done boxing before many years ago and I knew that I needed to do something that was going to create a routine for me. Uh, and something that was going to pique my interest. So I, I began training uh, with a coach for bodybuilding. And after doing that, I competed for the very first time. And when I competed for the first time, it was a, such a liberating feeling for me. I have a scar on my stomach 
going down the center of, of my stomach. And I was always very subconscious about that and never really liked to show it publicly. So when I got on stage in my two piece, <laughs> right, for the very first time, I mean, it was like, wow, you know, I have a scar, but I'm not scarred, right? This is who I am, flaws and all. And I knew in that moment while I was standing on the stage for the very first time, Beauty Fit Strong was literally birthed in that moment. I knew that I wanted other women to feel that same empowering feeling, that same liberating feeling that I felt when I was on stage for the first time. Was it hard to train in the diet, the focus, and it, you really have to be focused, especially with the diet? Girl, hard is a, is a nice word. <laughs> it, was, it, it challenged me in ways that I didn't know I could be challenged, but because of that, on the other side, like I said, once I got on the stage, I felt like, oh my God, like this was this was amazing. It gave me a, a confidence that I probably didn't have before. Um, because I'm like, if I could do this in six months, you know, literally preparing for competition, what else can I do? And that's where the business came into play. It was like, well, I can I can do this, and I can, you know, I can help other women in the, in the same respect. And women would I, would actually approach me in a gym, you know, oh, Audrey, you should train me. You should. And I'm like, wait, but I, I had a coach. I don't know if I could do for you, you know, what was done for me because I just followed her instructions. And uh, of course I went and got my personal training certification and, um, you know, did what I needed to do to be prepared, not just to be a trainer, but also to run a business and to be able to do that independently, independent of a larger gym or corporation. So I trained for a long time every day and uh, on the gym floor, you know, we, we, we practice, we work with different clients. And by the time I was done with that, I felt confident enough to be able to say, OK, I can I can absolutely do this. And I literally just walked up to clients in the gym saying, you know, if I noticed something about their form or something that they were doing that I could uh, support them with or correct them. And I, that's how I started. I started like that, saying, I can help you deadlift without hurting your back, you know, those kinds of things. And then I built up the business from there. I started going from gyms to in-homes to getting contracts with uh, city agencies and ultimately opening up my own fitness studio. Was it hard to learn the business aspect of it? It is still hard. <laughs> it is. It has been. It's one of those things where I believe even with uh, folks who have business degrees and I don't, a lot of things you can't, you won't encounter or you won't learn until you're actually in it and work in the business. Uh, and so I've learned to go with the ebbs and the flows, right? The highs and the lows. I've learned to utilize resources that have been made available to me. Philadelphia has a plethora of them from all kinds of, you know, city organizations to uh, nonprofit entities that support women-owned businesses, that support minority-owned businesses, um, that support fitness businesses. So I've just linked up with those various different entities and utilized their resources and their services, you know, to support me as a business owner. Back to bodybuilding. You didn't mention that you got first place in a master's figure and second place in open figure. And that's impressive for your first time competing. So I didn't do that my first time. My first show, my no, <laughs> my first show, I didn't place at all. So I always share that with people, you know, because, you know, it's a subjective sport. And so, you know, it's, you know, judges think, you know, looking at the um, competitors and saying, you know, she has the body that I think mo is most like a figure competitor, you know, and it's, you know, it's like that. But for me, the win was the first time was me really just getting up there on the stage and, and being brave and courageous enough to do that for the very first time. I didn't even place in my first show. So I had to go back to the gym, <laughs> right? Get back to square one, you know, tighten up my diet even more, you know, be more consistent, you know, with my workouts, you know, improving my strength and just doing all, all the things that I need to do and push a little bit harder, you know, for a little bit longer before I was able to place. So what was your typical diet when you were training? 
So at the time, so I'm, as you know, as you know, I'm plant based now. I've been plant based on and off for some years now. But while I was competing, I was eating protein. So uh, animal based protein, like grilled chicken, broiled fish, asparagus, sweet potatoes. And these are all things they didn't have all the butter, the olive oil, any of that. It was very straightforward, you know, in terms of the foods, lots of water, over a gallon of water a day did eat after a certain time. So, you know, intermittent fasting was was a huge part of it. Uh, Carb cycling and intermittent fasting, for those of you who may not know, it's about sending the body into fat burning mold and burn it into the fat stores that are already on the body. Mm -hmm. And so eating within a certain time frame. So I would stop my eating at like seven o'clock, but I also wouldn't eat again until about 11 o'clock or so the next day. So I would pretty much skip breakfast um, and then get all of my meals after that in between that time frame. So between 11 and seven time frame. But with that, I would also spread meals out. So I would eat small meals, very small meals, but spread them out like eating every two and a half to three hours. So it was interesting, very regimented, very like clockwork. So what it did for me structurally, it gave me like the discipline, you know, it gave me structure around my eating. And those were habits that I was able to take out of bodybuilding and, you know, incorporate it in just my lifestyle overall. So that, of course, drinking more water, the carb cycling is a very useful tool as well. So with carb cycling, it's like high, moderate, low amount of carbs in terms of grams. Um, And your high days would be your days where you have, like for you, you're as a triathlete, it would be your days where you're like running and biking at the same time or running long distance or doing very strenuous work with heavy output. And then your moderate day, you would have a little bit less carbs. That would be a day you might work out, but not as hard. You know, and that's a personal kind of gauge, how you would gauge that. And then the days that you don't do much at all will be low to no carbs. Okay. So really giving for you and the body and giving the body what it needs, no more and no less. So did it take a while to kind of figure out like what worked best for you or you just kind of listen to your coach? You So you listen to your coach, but your coach is also learning about you as well. And that's why I always tell people, you know, be patient, you know, with your coaches. Your coach should be someone who's patient with you as well, Um, because with any program, you're learning and you're tweaking along the way um, because everybody's body responds differently, you know, to different things. I always say there's no cookie cutter, you know, kinds of approaches and not everything works for everybody. So sometimes it takes time to figure that out. And like, how many days were you actually in the gym? Every day, seven days a week? Every day. So in bodybuilding, we're known for, or our workouts are known for what's called five-day lifting splits. Um, And with the five-day lifting splits, you lifting lifting or working a different body part each day. Uh, And so like one day you might do chest, you know, chest and biceps or chest and and biceps and triceps. Another day you might just do your back. One day you might do legs. So it it allows that body part, whatever one you work, uh, to have complete and total rest before you get back to it again. And that way it makes hypertrophy easy because you really want to break and tear those muscles so that they can grow. But you all, in order for them to grow, they, you know, they got to fully recover. So. So you mentioned that you used to box as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That was my first fitness love. So, <laughs> so boxing was, you know, early on in my in my in my um, social work career. It was a healthy outlet at that time for me. You know, I got all my stress out on the heavy bag. I got all the stress out on my sparring partners. Poor thing. Uh, <laughs> so it allowed me to do that in boxing. For those of you who've done it, I mean, hands down, it's the best conditioning sport out there. We saw that with, what was the guy named that we're doing the challenge with? <laughs> Nate, Nate Johnson. <laughs> the fight this weekend, the other card with Roy Jones. And, 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 Robinson. Yes. <laughs> Gotta be conditioned or you will get knocked out. So 
But boxing was that for me. It was a it was a wonderful, healthy outlet, best conditioning, hands down. And that's why I said when I went into bodybuilding, I'm like, I think I'll like this because it's something that you can always get better at. And you know it with running, with triathletes, you can always improve your time. You can always, you know, be better at it. So you're always working toward, you know, a, a greater goal, or you, at least you could be. You know, and for me, that's a motivator. You know, if I want to, you know, do do a little bit better, place better, you know, it requires a little bit more of you. So you can always work toward that. How long did you do it? Five years. I boxed amateur boxing. And when I boxed amateur, I'm not going to tell my age. But I, <laughs> I, it's so funny because I used to laugh at, at my elders when they used to like, they, I'm like, but is it that big of a deal? But when you become a woman of a certain age, you're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Do I really want them to know that? But yeah, 20 years ago, I'll, I'll just be straightforward with that. I was boxing amateur boxing. And at that time, you know, it was before Clarissa Shields. It was when Layla Lee was first coming on the scene. My good friend, Jackie Frazier. And it wasn't a lot of female boxers at that time. Fortunately, you know, being in Philly, Philly is a fight town. Philly is a fight place. So I was able to get some fights. But it was very challenging back then for female fighters, especially those of us who took it seriously. (laughs) We had to travel. You know, I had to go to New Jersey and all different places to try to make matches because in amateurs, they are very particular. So and safe, rather and making sure that you're matched up with somebody that's in your weight class and all those things. And it was challenging to find fights, but I was good at it. And how long did you um, bodybuild? How many years? Bodybuilding, I did that for three, about three years straight. Um, And then I went into coaching. Even within that time, I went into, I began coaching. So to date, I put nine women on stage, all women over 40 years old. I made my first OCD figure pro two years ago. My last competitor was 65 years old, competing in her very first competition. That's amazing. Thank you. That is amazing. But tell me about all aspects of your beauty camps. You have your studio. You do, I guess, a lot of home Zoom training now with COVID. And you also do some wellness coaching as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's three um, facets to the business currently. We have the fitness studio, which is located in Philadelphia and East Falls, uh, where we offer personal training, small group training and group fitness classes there. Um, there's also a corporate wellness piece where we go out to companies, universities, namely the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where we do on-site training with the staff there. So we bring fitness to them. There's also the camp, Camp EFS, it's a girls program focused on health and overall wellness. And that happens for girls during the summertime for eight weeks. And in that program, we bring in women of all different careers and backgrounds. We have a STEM component. I know you love that. We've had some doctors, some physicians in and just folks sharing with the girls, you know, that we've done this. This has been our journey. This is what we do. And you can absolutely do it too. And so we do a lot of empowerment uh, with the girls, a lot of empowerment activities, self-esteem building activities. We have an etiquette curriculum. We do an etiquette luncheon, which was featured here on Fox 29. We had a lacrosse clinic, again, featured on Fox 29, where they were exposed to. Because that's what it's about. It's about exposure. Mm -hmm. We've had our challenges, you know, with health and wellness and, you know, trying to figure this out later on in life. And so for me, it was after working with the women, I had to find a way to get to us early. Um, And that's what the camp was all about. It was about you know, getting to the girls early and exposing them to he- uh, healthy eating. So we make healthy snacks with them at camp. We've done all kinds of cool stuff like strawberry salsa and we make guacamole with them and they make their own granolas and trail mix. And it's interesting because they're like little sponges. Mm-hmm. The kids are, they absorb it all. So when they start doing these things now, they go home and they're like, mom, dad, you know, we we we, we want to make this. We want to make that. And they actually become little influencers in their household <laughs> around healthy lifestyle. You know, they start out with things like yoga and they, they come in and so interested and they 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 won't don't want to do it. They're like yoga. Like, what is that? 
to I can't stop them from getting in poses when, when we're doing something else because, you know, their bodies begin to grade that. And then, you know, doing Zumba and all the other fitness stuff that they're exposed to. So that was the mission of the camp. That is the mission, you know, of the camp in terms of, you know, exposing them to these things early, health and wellness early. Do you get funding for your camp? So the camp is also uh, actually under the business and under the same umbrella. So we are still a for-profit entity. I have been successful with writing four grants for the uh, business. I've been successful with partnerships. I've received uh, community uh, grants and, and, and whatnot, mainly because even with the tuition, it's still a low cost program. So to be able to uh, build up a, a kit a fun, if you will, for scholarships and to be able to bring quality programming to the program. So we've done some fundraising efforts for that. Okay. Are your clients mainly women? All women, beauty fit strong, girls and women. And that's the that's the niche. That's the that's the calling. We're the largest consumers. Women are, are the largest consumers of, of fitness of, of wellness services. So we're the ones who will actually reach out and say, you know what, I need some help with this. I try with men. I've tried with men, right? So in the gym, it's so funny. <laughs> I'll be in like an LA fitness or, or, or a corporate gym, you know, just kind of, you know, working out or, you know, just kind of being there. And I'll see them doing stuff and I'll, and I'll correct them and I'll help them. And they're not always open. They're very comfortable with doing things the wrong way a lot of times. So. Whereas, whereas the women will seek out help, you know, especially when it comes to strength training, because they want to be able to do it safely. And we've also learned, we over the years, we've learned as women that strength training is is the game changer for us, you know, in terms of recompositioning the body, you know, turning that fat, you know, into muscle, achieving the bodies that we want, you know, through through strength training. So that's been, you know, useful and helpful for us as women. Do you do um, nutrition coaching as well? So I'm not a certified dietitian, licensed dietitian, certified nutritionist. I don't I don't hold any of those titles. Uh, what I do is nutritional suggestions or nutritional education, if you will. And that's really just making suggestions and pointers around some of the things we spoke about earlier in terms of intermittent fasting, in terms of carb cycling. I do provide different food lists but just things that I think would be good to have as research has shown, you know, that they help facilitate fat burning or muscle building. So those kinds of things I do. I have worked with nutritionists. I'm actually looking for somebody now new. So to partner with, I've learned that I'm great at what I'm great at. That's one of those business things, <laughs> right? Stick to that partner where it's appropriate. <laughs> and and outsource. Yep. Outsource. Season two, I will start a new series called Ask the Doc. If you have questions related to musculoskeletal injuries or musculoskeletal health, please send me a voicemail. Go to my website at www.weouilife.com we o u i love dot com. Click on the tab voicemail. Leave your voicemail, and select messages will be aired and answered on the segment. Now back to the episode. So back to strength training, because I know a lot of athletes are guilty of neglecting strength training. I was actually when I was interviewing your husband, he told me how he personal best after strength training with you because you think that you want to spend more time running to be a better runner or me with doing triathlons is so much trying to bike swim and run if I neglect some I usually neglect strength training which is not good because that is kind of like the key the focus because if you have a strong core and, and strength you're less prone to get injuries you're yeah. better better at whatever sports you're doing. So can you reiterate or go into detail of how important strength training is? And even if it's just 
a few minutes or if you're doing it at home, because with a lot of gyms are still closed with COVID, depending on where you are in the nation. So it's hard to get the strength training from a gym because I haven't been to the gym since March other than the swim, actually. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for, for I always say, make sure you're training for what it is that you're doing. And, and like you said, if you run, you want to run, but you also want to cross train, right, for running. And so with Uche, in terms of running, we do a lot of plyometric type stuff as well, which you could do right at home. So box jumps, so doing power movements. We do stuff with resistance bands where I have them running, you know, away from the resistance bands and anything that's going to, any movements that's going to help them with power, explosiveness, deadlifts, a lot of single limb work, especially for runners, because what do you do? You go from one side to the other. So a lot of times folks will, you know, they'll do squats and they'll do deadlifts. But what about pistol squats? One leg. What about single leg deadlifts? you know, to really work each side of the body to make sure that there's no imbalances there because it's in the imbalances where the injuries can occur. So making sure tra- you're training both sides of the body individually as well. So it is key, you know, to, like I said, preventing injuries is will help him get faster. So more power, more explosiveness, more en- endurance, right? So more strength endurance. So being stronger over time. Uh, you absolutely, if you're not doing cross training, you're missing out on a segment of your training that's, that could be key to getting better. And that was what we talked about, you know, when you're in certain sports and you're looking to meet goals, you're trying to PR, you know, you're trying to qualify, you know, for special races. You definitely want to consider putting a strength training plan in place. And as particular coaches, there's people who specialize in, in, in strength and conditioning for specific sports. I would take a look at, you know, a coach who has a specialty, you know, and in your particular sport, or at least can train you intelligently around what you need to do to be better at that sport. What would you say to someone who have never strength trained before and they want to get started? What is the the best way or the best way to start? Get a coach. (laughs) Get a coach. If you can't afford a, a coach, then you shouldn't be strength training. Okay. So here, right. No, seriously, because you can really get hurt, right? Now, I, I know somebody, I'm not going to name any names, who decided to do a, a mild swim by watching YouTube and they had to get pulled out of the ocean. So I'm just saying, you know what I'm talking about. I'm waiting for say no name. <laughs> but you, <laughs> crazy. Girl was like, let's make sure the insurance is paid up, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you come out this water, you know, I need to be okay. But in, uh, in all seriousness, get a, if you can't afford a face-to-face coach right now, there's tons of options available virtually mm-hmm. that may be more affordable. Group semi-private sessions are also more affordable. So if you can find a coach that can coach maybe say three people, not 10, but three people, so you'll still get personalized attention. You'll be able to learn the movements, be able to do them safely, you know, at a more affordable cost, right? So get a coach. There's all levels of coaching. There's all types of coaching. There's even apps available like Fitness Builder, Beauty Fit Strong is coming out one in January, where we'll have, we'll be able to show you, we'll have an avatar, we'll be, we'll be able to demonstrate movements. But again, we're not there with you. So if you can, cut some stuff out of your budget. The best way to do that, when I sit in consults with my clients, we take a look at what they're spending money on. (laughs) And most times, folks are spending a ton of money eating out each week. And so I can switch your mindset and say, okay, let's take this eating out money that you're spending. Go do some grocery shopping, do some meal prepping. You'll be able to shave off some there to be able to put that uh, into your training budget. You know, a lot of times you're spending money, you know, on things that you may not need to at that time, at least, you know, for a short period of time, if you want to get a coach to say for, you know, three months or six months, you know, you can cut out some things, move some things to the side for a little while, namely eating out, (laughs) fast food, (laughs) no shaming. I'm not shaming. We're all guilty of it. Um, cutting back that, you know, the the happy hour budget, you know, right now might be 
<laughs> a little high. So whatever you need to do, but I would definitely say if you're new to strength training, if you know nothing about lifting weights, definitely try to hire a coach. What would you say for the best way to stay on program to keep their motivation going? So a coach is going to do their best. They're 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 financially invested, right? <laughs> and keeping you consistent. And they should be, you know, invested in, in you overall. I always tell my clients, your goals become my goals, right? And I want you to be successful because if you're successful, I'm successful. And then you're going to look good. You're going to feel good. You're going to go tell a friend and then they're going to come, right? I don't even want to have you forever. I really want to work myself out of a job. I want to give you the tools that you need that you can do independently. And then I can back up. I can be out of the equation because I understand what we just talked about. Not everybody's going to have a budget or have a budget long term. So having a coach will help you with accountability. Also, I talked about semi-private or small groups. You have the people who are in your group who can help hold you accountable. You have all of the Facebook groups, all of the different fitness groups that you can participate in that'll help provide accountability. I mean, literally all they want to come on there and do is talk about what they've done in their workouts, right? What they accomplished and then on a daily basis. And so that can serve as an outlet or a motivator as well, utilizing that of those things as tools and resources to keep you going. Set a goal for yourself. You know, we talked about doing races, doing competitions, triathlete, triathlon, did longer distance, and those kinds of things. If you have a goal on the front end, you're more likely to be consistent. And I'll tell my clients, they'll say, Audra, I want you to train me like I'm going to do a competition. I laugh. <laughs> like, they say, train me like I'm going to do it like I'm, I'm, I'm like, you're not going to do it like until you actually register, right? Until you commit. Then it's different. It's game on. You know, when you're signed up for a show and you know you have, you know, six months, eight months, however long, you're going to train differently. You're going to work out differently. So if you're trying to pretend, it's not going to work because the moment you start negotiating with yourself (laughs) and that's either with the food, you know, what you're going to eat that you're not supposed to or get into the gym. Right. So Mm -hmm. you're like, well, I ain't really doing the competition, so I don't have to go, (laughs) you know. So do it. Sign up for that race. Sign up for that competition. Sign up for that bike ride. Whatever it is, sign up for that in advance or with your coach, right? Because you want a realistic time frame. So if it's if it takes a certain amount of time, you sit down with your coach. So you don't want to sign up for a competition next month and you hadn't started yet. Oh no, that ain't gonna work. I know it. Look, and I'll tell the truth. So the one of the, the first things that I do when people say, Audra, I'm, 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 I'm seriously, when they're seriously interested in competing, they got to take a picture for me in their sports bra underwear. That's the first thing they got to do, right? And then that way I see where they are. And then I know I, as a sculptor, I know what it's going to take time, energy wise and commitment wise for them to get there. And from there, I can say, okay, I think you'd be able to, to get ready for this show or that show, mm-hmm. you know? But yeah, first thing is you got to be realistic. Got to be realistic with those goals. So even if you stand, you're going to start out with a race, you're like, you might want to be able to do a 5K before you commit to. So being realistic is key. So what advice would you give for people who have they've been in the gym, their diet, they've been consistent, but they hit a plateau? Oh, we all do. Yeah. you like, you want to cheat because I'm, I'm not losing weight anyway. I just, let me go on and eat these. I quit. <laughs> I give up. This is not working. It's not working. Listen, it's a journey, not a destination, right? It's a journey. It's a lifelong journey. There's going to be highs, lows, ebbs, fools. There's going to be bumps in the road. You just have to keep pushing, keep pushing. Reset. Sometimes you got to reset. That's a good time to, okay, take a look at what you're doing, what's working, what's not and what you can do differently, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, moving forward from there. Sometimes you got to reset because your body will adjust. You know, one of the great things I learned about bodybuilding, the reason why we're able to dial in and dial in against leaner and leaner and leaner is because we're not changing a whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. If we change our diet, we're not changing our workout, right? So we might add 15 minutes more cardio, but we're not changing anything about what we're eating. Or we're changing something about our eating. We're taking out 20 grams of carbs. We're not training anything. It's very to the T, 
very to the T and very specific. And so what happens with people, sometimes they're doing a million things and they don't know what's working. They don't know what's working and what's not. You Sometimes you got to scale back. Okay, let me just see how it, how this walking is affecting me. Let me just see how this bike riding is affecting my body. And that's part of what you talked about with understanding your body and what works best for you. You know, some people do well with doing sprints, but some people do well with doing long, steady state cardio, you know? And so you have to know and understand your body and what works well for you. And sometimes doing that means you got to kind of take a step back and slowly, gradually add some things in and slowly, gra- gradually make some changes. So, yeah. And you do that with a coach or you do it with your accountability partner, but you don't give up. You don't give up. You hit a plateau. We all have, you know, you have your highs, you have your good, your bad. You know, you just keep going with it and recognizing, you know, like I said, that it's it's a journey and, and, and not a destination. What about people who've been working hard, but they work out too much for the diet and like your body is starving. And that's one reason they may not be losing weight. Yep, that's very well. That's very, very well a possibility. I get a lot of that. But people like, but I don't eat anything. <laughs> well, the body needs fuel, right? It can't run on empty. And so you absolutely need to be eating something, all right? And you need nutrient-dense food. You need nutrition. You need, you know, all the different colors of, of the fruits and the vegetables. Like, you still need all of those things. And sometimes people think, okay, if I just take everything out, you know, and and exercise, I'll be fine. Well, no, that's not how it works. Because <laughs> your body's like, wait a minute, let me just hold on to this right here, because I don't know when I'm going to get anything mm-hmm. again. So balance is key. And tracking, there's tons of tracking tools out there. Beauty Fish Strong will have, uh, I have a tracking uh, system on my app. <laughs> So hopefully by the time this air beauty fish strong is the app you can download it on Apple or Android. There's food tracking devices on there. There's also exercise tracking devices available on there that you can utilize to put in all of your food and it'll give you like your macronutrient breakdown. Uh, Because a lot of times, especially for women, one of the things that I've learned is that women tend to overeat our carbs and under eat our protein. All right. And so if we're not tracking, we will always say, oh, when I'm eating good. Oh, but I eat fish. I eat this. You know, I'm drinking enough water. I get this many bottles. Track it. And even if you don't track it long term, track it for a short period of time, just so you can gauge and kind of see where you are and see what changes might need to be made. Because again, a lot of times when I see it, when I have my clients track and we take a look at it just for a week, we'll notice, I'll notice that in their snacking and, and, and all their meals, if they're eating multiple meals throughout the day, they're not eating enough protein. I found that too. Um, I saw a nutritionist and I do, I track now. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. It's like a habit. It's like I usually plan my day before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I may adjust some things, but I know exactly what I'm going to eat. So I know how many calories, how many protein, how many, because I wasn't, doing eating enough protein now i do a like mm-hmm. shake in the morning that's the only way i can because i don't i eat fish now but i don't get enough protein just from eating like my meat at dinner so the protein shake in the morning usually helps yes yes and i i, I love them because they're good they're convenient with the shakes so even like you said in the morning if you if you find that by the end of the day you don't have enough you know you can drink one at night you know, just to fill in the gaps with the protein. Vega is my favorite, and that's a good plant based. And even when I am doing dairy, like I can't do way, way just, you know, with my stomach, it doesn't do well. So I tend to lean toward the plant based proteins. So, what else do you have envisioned for your business? You mentioned your app, and you mentioned to mm-hmm. me that you, you have a new location. What else is coming? Oh, it's coming. <laughs> I'm grateful. I, I really, I really thank God for allowing me to push this vision forward. I'm just a vessel. So I'm always humbled and grateful because I, I couldn't even imagine uh, some of the things that have, you know, come with the business from the business. But um, the new studio space is one. We're going to grow out the uh, corporate wellness 
piece of the business as well. So that's in the work. The app is coming as well uh, early next year. And the studio will be open. We'll have our open house the January 2nd when the city allows us to open back up again. I'm in the process of working with the city, with the uh, district attorney's office. So I just solidified a contract with them to work with their juvenile diversion program. So that's part of the camp, if you will. So the camp will be providing a year-long program. Okay. We'll be doing some after after school or after Zoom now programming with the juvenile diversion program. And that is, you know, it's really come in full circle for me because that's where I started, you know, in the services. And so being able to partner with them, with teens who have been arrested Mm -hmm. and they don't want to uh, adjudicate them. And so they go before a panel. And with that panel, uh, they decide on programming that will help facilitate them turning their lives around. Okay. How about that? (laughs) So beauty fish a part of that. And so bringing all of the stuff that I talked about earlier that that that's in the summer program to after school. So we're partnering with them. We're in talks with Carson Valley, which is a residential program and, and, and bringing them on board and a couple of organizations as well. So again, I couldn't have dreamt this up. <laughs> I couldn't have dreamt any of this up. And so pulling in partners, pulling in people that you know, staff, you know, right now I'm training, getting the folks ready, uh, folks ready for the um, diversion program, mm-hmm. but pulling in staff like in the studio. So growing, you know, uh, we're growing in terms of staff and, you know, partnerships and, and all of that. So I've, I've had to be stretched <laughs> this year, especially with COVID, with all of the changes, the back and forth. Yeah. It's been a a for real stretching, but out of it, I feel like on the other side of this thing that we're we're gonna come out wiser, you know, sharper, more compassionate, right? More, more, more caring. That's true. Yeah, I mean, we not only did we have COVID this year, but we we had you know we had the civil unrest, you know, and so you know we've had to take a look at you know this world and you know how how things have been done and what needs to be done differently. And I believe that people's hearts were pricked in this time. Like people were forced to look in the mirror, mm-hmm. you know, and take some responsibility and personal accountability around how we've been treating one another. And so I'm excited about all of this. It's been hard without a doubt, but I believe on the other side of this, we're going to come out better than we were when we went in. I do too. So part of my podcast is having guests who overcome obstacles to make it to their finish line. Can you tell me about some of the obstacles that you went through, how you overcame them and you you made it to today? So, yeah, that's the book, right? Uh, (laughs) That's the book that has yet to be edited and released. (laughs) Shout out to Weta who got hers out there, who uh, directed me to code to help me get my written. But it's it's Beauty Fish Strong, the, the journey from abandonment and low self-esteem to empowerment and healing. And so I experienced myself. One of the reasons why, you know, I have this anointing or this calling of, of healing, you know, on my life is because I've been through so much where I needed to be healed and where I needed to be delivered and set free you know, from, from, from not feeling like I'm enough, Mm -hmm. from not feeling like I could, I can. And that's why the work that I do is so important, especially with the girls to be able to, you know, share that with them, to share my journey, the things that I've had to overcome. Like I said, childhood drunk, being separated, you know, from my brother, being adopted at a, at a young age, as as a child, being separated from my siblings, you know, dealing with family, addiction and just all kinds of, I mean, you, you name it, growing up in the, in the city, you know, Philadelphia, just dealing with all that the daily trauma that comes along with that. And so, you know, having the opportunity to, you know, to get a good education and having all these opportunities that I, I, I have now, I feel like I'm in a position to pay it forward. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm in a position 
you know, I've been able to get through, I've been able to overcome it with counseling, you know, with therapy. Let me be clear on that. <laughs> Let me not skip over that. A lot of that black mental wellness, mental health is real. It is. We need to heal. You know, we need to not get over it, but we need to heal. And so I'm, I'm proud to say that I've done the work. You know, I started in high school with peer counseling, you know, with a guidance counselor who was absolutely amazing, you know, and all through college and just really utilizing those types of services to get the help that I needed to overcome some of the challenges, the personal challenges that I needed to overcome. And I believe that it was all part of this this journey of, that I needed to go through to get to where I am now, to be able to have the empathy, to be able to have the compassion, um, to be able to understand. You know, I can talk to the girls and I can say, I know, I know what that's like, mm -hmm. you know, but if you just do this, you know, if you just hold tight, if you just make good choices, you know, if you just surround yourself around the right people, you will be well, you can be well. Any last minute words of advice for my listeners? <laughs> to the girls, to the women, to the women, because sometimes with the women, so the women was the reason why I went back to the girls. And working with women, you know, I, I saw we were all dealing with some of the same issues, whether it was body image issues, whether it was stuff, you know, we all on some level and 78 percent of girls, you know, struggle with like body image issues. So what I would say is that to the girls, to the women, to the little girl inside the woman, mm -hmm. that you are more than enough, that you are powerful beyond measure. Just know that that you are more than enough, powerful beyond measure. Where can my listeners find you in Philly or virtually social media? So you can find uh, Beauty Fit Strong, beauty with an I, not a Y. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, or we're on Twitter. So you can definitely find us there. Um, our website is www.beautyfitstrong.com. We're in a studio here in Philadelphia. For those of you who are in Philly, we're in East Falls at 4027 Ridge Avenue, as well as 3510 Scott's Lane. Drop in, say hello, call me, right? Anybody who want to talk fitness, wellness, anybody who's interested in a consultation, you can reach me at 215-432-0414. And I'll put all the information in my show notes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Weeda. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for being on with me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. It was good catching up with you. Absolutely. Take care, my dear. That wraps up this episode of Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast. Thank you for tuning in. If you already haven't, please download Running is Cheaper Than Therapy podcast on Apple, Spotify, or however you listen to your favorite podcast. If you have any questions, concerns, or possible show topics, please email Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, OLB, Omaha Love Brown. Again, that's Run It Is Cheaper Than Therapy, Omaha Love Brown at gmail.com. I also can be reached via Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Handle We Life, We Love, O U I Life, O U I Love. Thank you and please tune in again.